All right, here we are. Good evening, everyone. Yes, I am. Uh, my name is Dylan McGinty. I practice law in Ottawa in mainly uh, estates and substitute decision making. So I'm there with families when they're with their loved ones, often in the healthcare setting, uh, making decisions for their loved ones. And I'm also there often as a substitute decision maker for clients who find themselves in the absence of family members who can take on that role. So I speak from the point of view of a legal practitioner who journeys side by side with clients, oftentimes in the healthcare setting, and very often, in fact, every day, in contemplation of end of life wishes and the planning of end of life uh, decisions. Okay. And I want to thank David before I continue uh, for that, uh, for your, your words tonight. I thought that they were uh, very insightful, you know, a, a world which I admit I, I don't have um, as clear a uh, view of, obviously, as David. So thank you. Um, I want to take you through what I wish to call radical autonomy in Supreme Court jurisprudence. I'm going to cherry pick some cases because I'm trying to highlight this idea that the individual can and should be autonomous to such a degree that it becomes justifiable to prioritize that autonomy over and against two things. Number one, vulnerable people. Okay, I think it's reasonable to say that we're all vulnerable in some way. But I think that there's been in recent years a prioritization, and I think this came through in David's talk tonight, that a premium on autonomy can often come at the expense of vulnerable persons who are not getting the support that they need. And I'll flush this out in a moment. Secondly, autonomy as being divorced from human nature itself and the, the normative principles, the the values that we can, as human beings, as rational animals, that we can uh, see or perceive in our own human nature and nature itself. So I wanna flesh that out a little more. Firstly, um, I want to bring you back to the 1993 decision of Rodriguez versus British Columbia, uh, the Attorney General of British Columbia. This 1993 decision was the precursor to the Supreme Court of Canada's 2015 Carter decision, which ultimately led to the legalization of assisted suicide. I'll, I'll say assisted suicide. It is the, uh, the, the, the so-called voluntary decision uh, to end one's life with the assistance of another. Now, whether it's a medical thing altogether itself, I think is a question that should be answered by um, medical ethicists and philosophers to understand what is the role of medicine and so on. Uh, but I'll call it assisted suicide for our purposes. Um, at, the risk of, at the risk of perhaps offending some, uh, but philosophically, I think that's the safer place to, to, to land. Okay, so let's go back to the Rodriguez decision. I want to bring you to the dissenting opinions, excuse me, the dissenting opinion of then Justice Leroux Dubé and Justice McLaughlin. Okay, this, this dissenting opinion was written by Justice McLaughlin for the two judges. And what Justice McLaughlin says, one of the things she says in her dissenting opinion is that Sue Rodriguez, who by the way, suffered a degenerative disease that would result in her death but which would cause prolonged suffering, okay? What Justice McLaughlin and Leroy Dubé were arguing was, in, in essence, Sue Rodriguez and others like her were being forced to end their lives prematurely because to suffer longer would mean to lose the capacity to end their own lives, okay? And so they would be losing days, shaving days off of their lives, by deciding to 
and their own lives sooner when they did have the capacity to do that. And so these two justices felt it was unfair that people like Sue Rodriguez could not have someone assist them in that, in ending their own lives. And what they said was, Sue Rodriguez is, quote, a scapegoat. She's a scapegoat to the rest of society because we're saying Sue Rodriguez cannot have assisted dying or assisted suicide because we're worried that by allowing that, we're going to open up the doors or the floodgates, they say, to abuse. But I want to make the following proposition, that there are actually two scapegoats here. The first would be Sue Rodriguez, the one who wants to pass away, but can't because of the law. Here's another scapegoat that's possible. Is the person perhaps languishing in a hospital bed who does not wish to die, and yet by the tragedy of their circumstances, operating under duress may choose assisted suicide, but would not have done so had they had adequate supports. So two different scapegoats, the one who wants to pass away and can't. And on the other hand, the one who desires not to pass away, but does. And so it, it seems to me that there's a danger there. If we allow assisted suicide, which we have done, there is a danger that at least one person will be that second type of scapegoat. The one who doesn't actually want to die by assisted suicide, but, but ends up making that call it constructed or artificial choice because they lack the social supports and the social determinants of health. Now, the greatest argument in my view against capital punishment is that one wrongfully convicted innocent individual is too high a price to pay for capital punishment. And yet, here we are in the year 2022, and we have set up an administrative apparatus that allows now hundreds of people to die by assisted suicide. And we know that they suffer psychologically. And furthermore, we know that they suffer existential distress, this, this trouble of understanding the meaning of my life given a tragic diagnosis. And yet we're still offering the service and seeing such people as autonomous. So this is, I think, troublesome, troublesome because it is is it, to me, it's an example of why the death penalty, in my view, should not be allowed. Because at least one person, innocent person, will perish by assisted suicide, having chosen it, but who arguably will not have wanted to have done that. So to me, radical autonomy is this exercise of freedom which prioritizes autonomy by some at the expense of allowing others to be, let us say, swallowed up into the administrative process and have their lives ended as well. So the prioritization of the exercise of autonomy, right, over the protection of the vulnerable. So to me, that's a step I, to me, that's a radical step in the exercise of autonomy. And the other way that I think radical autonomy is radical is because it sees the exercise of freedom as being fundamentally divorced from human nature and the normative claims that we see as coming out of that. For example, the sacredness of life, 
right? There is something I think innately understood in every human being about the fundamental worth of life. And, and this I think is devalued um, as, as David says, when you input into the legislation itself, the idea that disability renders a life less worthy of living, right? So there, I wanted to flesh out what I mean by, by radical autonomy. So we've gone through the scapegoat argument and the risk of effectively harming the other kind of call it scapegoat, okay? The one who doesn't want to perish, but does because of the lack of supports and the assisted suicide system we've set up. Okay, so I wanna walk you through a few cases. Okay, we obviously have the Carter decision, okay? I wanna bring you to the 1993 case of R versus Tremblay, a Supreme Court of Canada decision. Now, forgive me, these are uh, loaded topics and I hope that it's a um, adult only audience tonight. Uh, because in 93, the Supreme Court decided to allow common body houses to operate where there were uh, new dancers and peepholes and men who would watch and effectively pleasure themselves. So over and against what you, what you might call an objective ethics grounded in human nature and ultimate human goods and uh, the public good. Over and against those time-honored notions, right? The Supreme Court prioritizes individual freedom, individual autonomy, right? At the risk, I would submit, of fraying the social fabric that makes common existence and share human experiences possible, right? And then that, that case is followed up in 2005 in, by the Supreme Court in the case of R versus Labay, where the Supreme Court of Canada allowed swingers clubs for group sex. Now, these two cases are interesting because the court is, is flushing out the harm principle as being the justification for allowing these things, right? So what is the harm principle? Well, the harm principle goes back to John Stuart Mill, an English philosopher, who said that restraints on human behavior were only justified if they harm other people. But he carved out certain call them, uh, he called them constructive harms from those harms uh, that can be uh, prevented. So I'll read you a passage here, okay? So John Stuart Mill writes, with regard to merely contingent injury by conduct which neither violates any specific duty to the public nor occasions perceptible hurt to any individual except himself. The inconvenience is one which society can afford to bear for the sake of the greater good of human freedom. So he's carving out certain behaviors from what the state can legitimately prevent. The academic Georgia Duplessis notes, talking about Mill, not all conduct that causes injury or offense to society or other individuals is to be restricted. Mill agrees that an action that a person does to himself may seriously affect the sympathies, feelings, or interests of those closely connected to him. But these will not be definite damage or a definite risk of damage. These will be mere contingent or constructive injuries. And so Duplessis continues and she says, 
Thus, if a person watches pornography in the privacy of his home and the only external effect or injury thereof is that his neighbors are offended or appalled by this action, this will be considered a contingent injury, not part of Mill's three instances of definite damage. And therefore, no such action can, excuse me, such action cannot be limited. So you can see the premium on autonomy, but I query how far a society or a community or civilization can go when it's normative rules and traditions and shared language are so frayed by that premium on autonomy. And this, this will be proclaimed as a victory in terms of human progress. But if you see the link between autonomy and euthanasia, then I'm not so sure that it is a victory, right? So I hope that's been somewhat clear. This idea that the Supreme Court of Canada relied on Mill's harm principle in its development through time of criminal juris jurisprudence, okay? It, but the problem being that reliance on the harm principle, right, puts the premium quite a premium on autonomy at the expense of normative limits that make human flourishing possible and communal existence enriching, okay? And also that would prevent, for example, the, the, the commonly understood, the, the well-documented uh, phenomenon of suicide contagion. Right? Mill says, look, if you're harming yourself only, then that's fine. One can make the argument that assisted suicide only harms you. But we know that there is a contagion effect, that suicide is contagious. You will read in newspaper articles at the beginning or the end, you, you will read um, a helpline. The journalists are, instruction, are instructed to put helplines. They're also instructed not to glamorize or over-report on suicide. It's for this very reason. And yet, in the reporting of assisted suicide, I humbly submit, I've seen caution thrown to the wind. And again, I think it's because we're putting such a premium on autonomy. Whether we're seeing it, um, or whether it's really there, I think is an open question. Okay, let's, let's move on from that. Um, we've said a lot so far. How am I doing on time, Zoe? Okay. Um, you, you, you can go for maybe another 10 minutes or so. Sure. Here. I think you're okay. about halfway through. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Don't um, worry about Russia. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we've gone through the Rodriguez uh, descent, the scapegoat argument bit on radical autonomy and the harm principle, a couple of cases anyway, from the Supreme Court of Canada, which I think show radical autonomy. But lastly, I actually want to finish off by uh, maybe earning my stripes a little bit among the audience um, by sharing a story, a firsthand account that actually took place within the last four weeks. I had a client who uh, was terminally ill, was uh, admitted for surgery, declined the surgery, and she had appointed me as her legal attorney for personal care. I got to know this client a little bit. Um, I understood what her wishes were. Um, she had never said anything about assisted dying, but it became evident to me during her stay in hospital that this was the way she was leaning. Now this client, call her Barbara, she had a very small circle of friends. Uh, she was somewhat estranged from her only sister. I learned later she had a troubled relationship 
uh, with one of her parents. And here she was at the tender age of uh, 70 or 71 and had declined this heart surgery and now wanted to sign up for assisted suicide. And what I observed was this, the physicians around her were very willing to set her up with the consultation. And this client brought it up with me and I said, well, Barbara, it's ultimately your choice, but I can't give it my blessing. And she was sort of taken aback. And we had formed a very trusting relationship where she trusted me as her counsel. And she even trusted me on these personal care decisions. I mean, when someone appoints their lawyer as their substitute decision maker, it's normally because they don't have anyone else. And I don't take on that role easily. In fact, I learned later that she was sort of leaning on me on whether to um, go even go forward with, with the operation. And I had encouraged her to do so. But my point is this. I journeyed with this client over the course of three to four weeks. And she would bring this up with me periodically. In fact, for a time, it was every day. And my response was always the same. Barbara, the choice is yours, but I can't give it my blessing. And then I would encourage her. She was terminally ill, but I said, this is your, this is really your time to shine. This is not easy, right? But your suffering is going to make you a better person. And she would listen to me. And I could, I could see that it was sinking in. And I encouraged her. Finally, she said, no, you're right. You're right. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But she said to me, here's the second sort of headline. The first headline is that the physicians were very willing to set her up with the consult, which they did for assisted dying. The second headline is that through speaking with her, and I'm only a lay person in this regard, she changed her mind on multiple occasions, right? She'd come back to it. The third headline is that she was effectively languishing in a hospital bed. And she told me that. I said, why do you wanna die sooner? Well, I'm languishing here. The nurses are running in every other direction but mine. This is, I mean, no offense to acute care hospitals. They do amazing work, but they're set up to save people's lives. And so when you're there perishing, it's a different experience than when you're being saved. So this is what she told me, right? I'm languishing here. I want it to end. I can't handle it, right? These were words of hopelessness. So through speaking with her, I was able to convince her. Now I'm not, look, these are phone calls. I'm hardly twisting her arm, right? But it's amazing how much progress we were able to make speaking. And then the other thing, the fourth headline I want to draw to your attention is she was, I, in my mind, Barbara was in a sort of a toxic environment. She needed to get to a hospice. So I pushed and pulled and tried and made phone calls and finally got her into hospice care where she was much better set up. And then I could see the wish for a desire for hasten death dissipate even more and even more. And I share this story because to me, it was really evidence <laughs> that there are some, if not many, who unfortunately make the choice to end their lives sooner because on balance, they lack the support and they don't have someone who cares to say, no, I disagree. Your life is worth more, even in your dying days. And um, in the end, she died a peaceful death on February the 12th, Saturday at 2 p.m. 
when her sister was at her bedside and said, look, take your last breath, take a deep breath and go see mom and dad. And she did. And she died a peaceful death. So I think that through sheer luck, I was able to accompany someone and learn that, like I say, there are those, there are many who need someone to journey with them, right? And unfortunately, I think the legacy of Carter is that Barbara could have gone and been deemed perfectly autonomous when I know from what I saw, she was operating under duress. So I wanna thank you for listening uh, to my perspective as a lawyer and also a legal practitioner uh, with a, a bit of a, a personal point of view on the matter as well. So I thank you for your time.